down in front. <laughs> okay, thank you all for coming. We're super excited for you to see the new exhibit. I'm Summer, I'm the curator here at the museum. Um, before we get started, just a quick reminder to please turn off or silence your phone so we don't have any disruptions, and also to keep your masks on when you're not eating or drinking, because um, that is still the policy at the museum. Um, as for announcements, we have special holiday hours coming up the next couple of weeks. We'll be open for half the day on Christmas Eve, and then we'll close at 1 p.m., and then we're closed all day on Christmas. We'll also be closed for half the day on New Year's Eve and closed for all day on New Year's Day. Uh, as for upcoming programs, for our January brown bag lunch on the 5th, we will have the museum's archivist, Ron La Outler, Rhonda Outler, uh, speak about how to get started with genealogical research. And then for our January 3rd on 3rd, on the 21st, we will have Dickie Anderson speak about the new edition of her book, Great Homes of Fernandina. Uh, now called Great Homes and Churches, it features nine historic churches around town. So that's it for announcements, but tonight our two speakers are Bill Tilson and Mike Harrison. Bill Tilson is an emeritus professor of the School of Architecture at the University of Florida. In a 35-year career at UF, he taught design, studio, and theory and history classes from freshman to PhD level. His research project focused on preservation of historic seacoast communities in the Caribbean, which led him to Fernandina. He designed the original design guidelines for Old Town, the CRA, as well as several other projects for the city and local private parties. He is the vice chair of the Amelia Island Museum of History Board of Trustees and is on the board of the Amelia Island Restoration Foundation. Previously, he served on the Historic District Council in the Fernandina Main Street program. And then Mike Harrison was trained as an electrical engineer in England and moved to Evergreen, Colorado in 1980. His corporate career was through industrial marketing and quality management. He retired as general manager of the Gates Aerospace Batteries with products serving in geosynchronous and low Earth orbits. His post-corporate life in Fernandina has, has brought him to Old Town, for which he is a strong advocate, to the city's historic district council, where he is currently chair, and to the museum, where he volunteers in a variety of roles. His wife, Jennifer, is a past board chair and a current trustee. So everyone, please welcome Bill and Mike. Yes, we decided that you know one of us were up to doing the whole thing, so we, <laughs> we split it. But actually, uh, I think we have some different different views, and so what what we're going to do is I'm going to take the kind of the second Spanish period, talking about culture and changes that are happening, and Mike's going to take the post. Uh, 1821. So, um, why have we had these dates? Yeah, well, why are we starting in 1783? There's a lot of history before that. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you know what the 1783 date is? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's when the that's when the Spanish that's when the Spanish took over from the English, right? So we'll we'll talk about that for a bit, okay? And 1834 is somewhat arbitrary, but we've we've got a couple things later that Mike will talk about with George Clark and his will freeing his family, and that was in 1834. So we're not going past that. You know, what was the the date that Florida became a state? Remember that? 45. So we're not carrying that too much forward, okay? The Certainly, the, uh, the pivotal date there is 1821. Right. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's when it all starts to happen, and depending on your point of view, that's when all the fun went out of Florida. Does this work? <laughs> Does this work? What? Okay. Okay, just a, a little bit of background. This is the first map that I found um, that was uh, showed Florida in 1821. Um, and of course, what was interesting is the British set up East and West Florida, and when the Spanish came back, they maintained that uh, that setup with a capital in Pensacola and a capital in St. Augustine. Okay? 
And that's the, uh, the treaty there that ended the war, uh, the Peace of Paris. And what's interesting, even going back to the first Spanish period, that it was a refuge for slaves and other people that were sort of leaving the U.S. and coming. So there was already this tension developing between uh, the southern colonies and Florida. I'm going to pick you up a bit on that, because you, you, know, you say that there were a lot of slaves, runaway slaves coming to Florida. But Florida, east and west, were I think the 13th and 14th colonies of the, right. uh, of, of the empire then. And uh, with the Revolutionary War going on, the loyalists, those who were loyal to, to Britain, many of them thought, well, we'll, we'll come down to Florida. Yeah. Hmm. And, and so many of them came here. And, and we'll see as, as history develops, or as our story develops a bit, here, that many of those people uh, were very comfortable under the Spanish rule, but were very fearful when they found this sort of revolutionary bunch of states to the north um, wanted to take them over again. Yeah. So you can see, this is Florida's really a complicated place. It still is. <laughs> but here's here's some of the, the beginnings of that. So you have you have. Uh, English folks that stayed around. You have long-standing families who Spanish. We've got people from the Caribbean, people from Mexico, um, and we'll get more into that. Okay. Even Menorcans. Menorcans, yes. Okay. So a, a little bit about uh, about this. Uh, these this image on the left is a painting which we call Castas, which is in, in Spanish and Portuguese is lineage. Okay. And the idea was in Spain. There were all these uh, uh, stories about the complexity of, of the colonies, like in, particularly in Mexico and in Central America. Okay, um, and it's the, the idea that there was a strict caste system, which I think, I think, recent in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, there are scholars that are saying, well, that's not exactly the way it was. It was a lot more flexible and complex than that. But I think these were interesting, and they were made mostly by artists in Mexico. Uh, for people back in Spain to kind of really say, okay, all of this is going on. You have these mixture of marriages between uh, blacks and Indians and Spanish that were from Spain and Spain, uh, Spanish that were born in, in, in the colonies. And it's an organized system, right? And there are all these names, like there's like 24 names for the various, like if you're one quarter of black and you married an Indian, and then your child married a Spaniard. I, I don't even remember what the name is, but this was uh, uh, what was presented as a very rational and strictly defined system. In mm -hmm. practice, in practice, it was not that way. And particularly in Florida, you know, which is doesn't have uh, doesn't have silver mines. It doesn't have a lot of population. If you go to Mexico. Mexico City, you have the silver mines in Guanajuato and San Luis Potosí, etc. And so there, were, there was a, a very different attitude about race and work than there was in Florida. And, and yet, Bill, mm -hmm. back in Madrid, back in the home country, uh, Spain had an excellent history of integration mm -hmm. of, uh, of other cultures uh, and of, uh, of inclusion. Mm -hmm. They were insistent that everybody have a part of the uh, have a part of the country. Yeah, it's, it, it, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's uh, since since uh, <coughs> slaves are, are a big part of, of of all of this discussion here, based on if you're developing plantation, you're developing mines, etc. So it's important. One of the things that we're we're contrasting is the way. Slaves were seen in the Spanish system as opposed to the American system, and it's really quite straightforward. <laughs> there were basically three sort of uh, groups of people in the Spanish system. Number one, you have which were called peninsulares, which are people from Spain that came here. Then you have uh, criollos, which are uh, creoles, which are Spanish descent, mother and father, and they were born in the Americas. And then you have mestizos, you know, which are a combination of Indians, Spanish, uh, blacks, you know, and it, and it gets really, really complex in that sense. Okay, but one of the things that goes back even to the 
uh, the 15th century Castilian slave codes is that the idea that slaves were human beings with a moral and a, 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 a judical sort of a relationship, uh, which I think is, is quite interesting. Now this is not, the Spanish were by no means like, uh, you know, you know, perfect in dealing with all of this. Particularly if you go into Mexico, there's some horrible things that were going on here. I used to we, say, but I never we, expected the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, we could talk about that, but we, we won't. There were actually some, like Indians were not, could not be made part of the Inquisition, for instance. You know, they had their own culture. So, I don't know enough about that to go in, and you're probably bored with all of the, the details of that, okay? But if, in Florida in particular, the, the work was based more on the task system. You know, there weren't any mines, okay? There weren't major building projects. So basically, you were in agriculture, you were working in, in the city, like in St. Augustine, you were a carpenter, you were doing whatever, okay? And you were, you were given tasks like that. So it's a, it's a very different sort of situation than you found in other parts of Latin America. Okay. Just as a, a little background, the, the, the exhibit down, downstairs goes into this a lot more. But I wanted to bring up the fact that in Latin America, what's happening is that you, you've got all this chaos that's going on in Europe with the Napoleonic Wars. And you've got, you know, all of this mixing of races in, in, the, in the Americas. Things are really starting to change. And in Mexico, uh, Miguel Hidalgo starts the, the, the independence movement in 1810, September 16th, which is Independence Day in Mexico, not uh, Cinco de Mayo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, that goes on for... for for like you know, 11 years, and, and look at the date that they gained independence. It's 1821, yeah. right? So all of this turmoil that's going on, the things with the U.S. and around Latin America, is affecting the, the relationship between the U.S. and, and yeah, Mexico. Yeah, well, all those Spanish colonies wanting to uh, get their independence. Yeah. So I just like this. This is the uh, <laughs> El Grito de, de, de Dolores that he rang the church bells and screams mm -hmm. out that long live our lady of Guadalupe, death to bad government, and death of the uh, gachapines, gotcha which are the, the Spanish-born citizens. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So there's, uh, there's a lot going on in this yeah. time period. Right? Oh, I love your neighbor there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know if any of you see Dr. Dr. Head's talk last week yeah. at all. You know, and you can see this on the on the on the museum website. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. He goes into all of these things with uh, McGregor and the pirates, and we've got more information in the exhibit. But I just wanted to bring up this the context. All of these tensions, all of this sort of chaos that's going on here, is attracting people like McGregor, probably the biggest con artist of the last 200 years. Um, Not really. Uh, <laughs> no. No. Okay. Uh, 150 years ago. Uh, and you probably know about the Patriot Wars. These are pretty much uh, uh, folk soldiers and even the governor of Georgia coming in and trying to sort of uh, re uh, react against uh, Indian raids, runaway slaves, and the fear that, that Florida was becoming something that would undercut their whole economy. Okay. So all of this is happening, and 1817, uh, we have McGregor and, and Luis Aury that you probably have heard of here. Okay, so th this is a this is a very rich, complicated setting, right before, and it's it's contributing to the development of the treaty, the Adams and East Treaty that will t that will give Florida to the U.S. Okay, it didn't just happen in a vacuum. Now, other things that are kind of interesting and complex here are the difference between Spanish land grants and the U.S. system of, of latitude and longitude, which Jefferson set up. So there's a national grid that's moving down south. And if you, this is a little hard to see, but those little uh, trapezoidal shapes up there in the north end of the island, 
those are, are grants given by the king to prominent people like uh, Domingo Fernandez, uh, Susana Cashin, for instance. Um, uh, and in fact, the little tight grid up there on the left, you can see that's the area of Fernandina, okay, mm -hmm. the old town. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do, you know about the Fernandez grant over the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. You seen that? Mm -hmm. yeah. That piece of land between the two church buildings is the last remaining uh, land grant in the same family. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Fernandez family still owns. They have a cemetery in the middle, and that little park there is is still in that family. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some of the relatives there are on the wall back there. Okay. The Villa Longas. Okay. Now, did, didn't the Spanish use a different way of uh, oh, yeah, presenting right. the land? Yeah, it's uh, it's called meets and bounds. So, for instance, rather than having latitude and longitude, you say, you see that oak tree over there in the corner? <laughs> and we draw a straight line down to this large rock, mm -hmm. and then along the, the property of where, where that cow's place, standing. And, <laughs> and that's your property. And what it will happen after the, the uh, Florida goes into the U.S. is that real difficulties in trying to get figure out who owns what property, where it is. Mm -hmm. It goes on for 20, 40 years. And in fact, this Fernandez property, uh, there was a legal battle back in the, what was it, forget, 80s or 90s? You know, the church wanted to take the property. Mm -hmm. So that's another... Another block talk. <laughs> okay. So George Clark, being appointed as uh, Surveyor General, uh, had a pretty, pretty significant job. Hmm. Yeah. And it, this Michael will bring this up later, but he's one of these people that bridges the the, the Spanish and the, and the the American period. And even if you see that, he's English. He became Spanish, and he died American citizen. You know, as the treaty set up anybody that was here, that, that was living here, could become an American citizen. We'll see how that plays out. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you know this. Anybody from Old Town here? Okay. So it's here. Uh, I just wanted the that Clark was asked by Governor White at the time in 1811 to organize the town, which was, a, a, as I've read, was a total mess. Wherever you want to build something, it's like just impossible. So they impose the, the Spanish law of the Indies, part of which gives you guidelines for making an organized town. Okay, and this is just this is uh, about uh, 1820, 1817, 1821. Now this photograph over there to the left is from the 1870s of Old Town, but I just wanted to point that out because the the dimensions of the lots there were, were set up for a person to be self-sufficient in terms of agriculture. Mm -hmm. We call that urban agriculture now. Mm -hmm. But this is the idea. And you can see those small plots and little houses that are down here at the bottom that indicate that. That's, mm -hmm. I don't think you have that in your lot. I could be. <laughs> <laughs> a few carrots. Tear down <laughs> <the house. laughs> Okay. So, this uh, we've relied on a couple of a um, couple of really good scholars. Uh, Jane Landers, who was at UF for a long time, she's at uh, um, Vanderbilt, I think, and she's one. She's written a very good book, going back, looking at all of the the archives and census. And Fernandina is quite was quite an interesting spot because you had a kind of mixture of people that were wealthy, that were poor, that were slaves. That were freemen. They were freemen that owned slaves. You know, George Clark lived here. You know, and all sorts of other things. It's quite, quite fascinating to look at. And Jane, uh, ident I've sort of colored in the lots where she's identified uh, black residents there that were, uh, uh, you know, free or, or just living. Um, um, so, no, I think it's important to recognize that at this period, 1811, 1821. Uh, was a pretty boom period for Fernandina. Mm -hmm. It was getting its business through smuggling. Yeah. <laughs> because the United States had got, got its embargo act, it had closed its ports to foreign trade, mm -hmm. uh, it had 
uh, stamped down on the slave trade and the importation of slaves. But lo and behold, here's a nice deep water port, <laughs> and it's not part of the United States. Yeah. So anything goes here. <laughs> Whatever government there was was in St. Augustine. <laughs> and how are you going to tell them there's a problem here? you got to write a letter <laughs> down to the provincial governor and say, uh, my neighbor just uh, just uh, stabbed my cow. <laughs> and it's going to take five days to get there. And even if he responds immediately, another five days for somebody to get back here. It's, um, it, it was a wild west area, I think. It's kind of like, uh, kind of like old town today, right? <laughs> Uh, here's here's a, a, a woman I, found, I was not aware of. You, you've probably heard of Anna Kingsley, I'm sure. Yes. Um, but Nancy Wiggins, and you can you can read here. She was a slave from Senegal, married, uh, had six children, and then her husband died, and so she ended up uh, managing all this property with her children. And she owned slaves and all these other things. Um, and I found she's got she had. She and her children had nine properties up, up in Old Town. <laughs> and of course, the, this is probably one of the most well-known persons. Uh, that yeah. you could, if you don't know a lot about this, there's several very good books on this person. Her husband, uh, Zephaniah, and, uh, and her. Okay. Now this, this is off of Dan Schaefer's uh, book. No one really knows. I don't think there are any contemporary images of her, but this was on, so it's kind of a, a you know, a guess of what she might have looked like. And last but not least, there's this gentleman, uh, John Marion Hernandez, and you can read, you know, he's descendant from the Mor Menorcan laborers from down in New Smyrna properties, which was a, a really horrific uh, place. And they, they migrated up to St. Augustine, and many descendants still there. Uh, they had lots of property. And what's interesting is he was he's the first person of Hispanic descent to serve in the in the U.S. legislature. So he's another individual that sort of bridges the Spanish and the American period and managed to have uh, a very successful financial and political career uh, moving forward. Okay. And there, there are many of these, you can't simply say, when it came to 1821, all these people were here and left. Um, it, it's, it's a much more interesting uh, scenario than that. So we're here, 1821, okay. Um, Mike is gonna talk more about some details of things we're doing here, but this, this is the map, a simplified map, uh, showing how Adams and Luis Onis set up the boundaries between the U.S., okay, yeah. in 1821. And of course, the crosshatch over there is Florida. Mm -hmm. Now, I know I, in this, We've got a couple of these magazines, the Forum magazine here, and I just happened to open it up, and there's a quote here by John Randolph, representative in Virginia, speaking in 1821 against U.S. acquiring Florida from Spain. He says, quote, it is a land of swamps, quagmires, frogs, alligators, and mosquitoes. No man would immigrate into Florida, no, not from hell itself. <laughs> and here we are. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, and uh, uh, what do you want? No, but the, uh, I'll take the clicker. Okay. Thank you. Um, Adams Onis, uh, John Quincy Adams. Secretary of State, and Onis, I think you found something out about uh, the length of his title, didn't you, Bill? Yeah, I forgot. It's, you can read it down there, but if you go in the exhibit, that we have a copy of the treaty, uh, and the, the preamble identifies the characters. It's like John Quincy Adams, Secretary of State with President Monroe, and then Luis Onis, Onis and his family name, which in Spanish is all of his grandparents and whatever, and then his titles, which go on probably 30 titles. <laughs> and in that, you get a real good idea of the difference between a monarchy and, and a democracy. So you've, you've got the 
the title yeah. in Onis compared with John Adams. <laughs> Citizen. Okay. Question. Which one was this? Well, oh, you're an engineer. <laughs> okay, so what's happening in Fernandina after 1821? Uh, Bill talked about uh, the, the platting by, uh, by George Clark of uh, what we now call Old Town, which was a, a military post at the time. And the, uh, the charge that he received uh, from St. Augustine uh, was to deal with the post and town that has grown up around it, which shall be called Fernandina. So, pretty small stuff at that point, but let's see what happens when the rule changes from Spain to the United States. There's a number of dimensions to it. There we go. So, some of those are clearly of nationality, you're moving from being Spanish to being an American citizen. In terms of race relations, uh, Bill has spoken about the uh, three caste system uh, that, the, that the Spanish uh, utilize. And I, I want to uh, repeat here that the, the three castes were essentially white, black, and free black. Mm -hmm. And the free blacks came essentially from slaves. Uh, Bill spoke about the Spanish belief that, uh, that, that blacks uh, were human, uh, had a humanity and, and a soul, and it was uh, through the development of those that a slave could obtain freedom. He could buy it, he could do it by meretricious acts, or um, if he was found some, doing something good by the governor, he could give him his freedom too. But you've, you've got the free black caste, which essentially has many of the same rights as, as a white citizen has, and very distinctly different from the lack of rights that, that the slave <coughs> has. In terms of government, well, locally, it, it was just military. There was an outpost here and probably uh, six soldiers uh, reporting to uh, St. Augustine, which in turn reported to, uh, to Havana, uh, which in turn reported to Madrid. And the guy in Havana, uh, the, the governor general there, uh, was the Marquis de Somerueros, from which we get Somerueros Street, which is probably the most unpronounceable and, and mispronounced street in, in Fernandina, if not Florida, and he had responsibility not just for East and West Florida, but also for the Louisianas and the uh, uh, and Cuba. So, and you can imagine the money coming out of Madrid, which was probably not too much, uh, got divvied up in, uh, in, a, in Havana, and probably a lot of it stayed there, and what was left uh, trickled down to, to here and uh, Louisiana. And what we have here, of course, is uh, a democracy. First it was appointed, and, and we'll see uh, the appointment letter, the first charter of, of Fernandina, and subsequently it, it was uh, an elected government. Uh, the place of government has moved um, uh, from uh, Madrid, essentially, to Tallahassee and, and Washington, D.C., further away. Uh, there was no government here. Uh, individuals could petition the, uh, uh, petition the provincial governor in St. Augustine if they wanted things, and, and he would grant them if, if he wished. Uh, but now we see Fernandina emerging as a, as a chartered city, Socially, there's a change from chaos to, I could say peace, but it's probably better to say silence. <laughs> because there wasn't a lot happening in, in, in Fernandina uh, after 1821, except the establishment of, of government and self-government, if you will. 
the economic drivers shifted from smuggling and some timber and naval stores and supplies uh, and certainly being a political football uh, to the importance of the harbor here uh, and, and we know how much influence the port still has mm -hmm. on, uh, on city affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit of uh, information here on the size of the population. Uh, this is from uh, Jim Cusack at, um, at UF. Uh, he's saying that in 1821 there were about 8,000 people in Florida Okay, Florida is a, as a whole 8,000, and that had grown to about 35,000 by 1831, 10 years later. And Mike, did they have the division between East and West Florida, or is it just all together? Well, the, the, this is interesting. The, the British did a great job in 1763. They said Florida is too big to be, <laughs> to, to be one colony, and so we're going to divide it. We're going to make it West Florida and what else? East, east. Water, okay? And where does West become East? It does that at the uh, Apalachicola mm -hmm. River. And the, uh, the headquarters, the capital of West Florida is uh, Pensacola, and East Florida is uh, St. Augustine. But this is, this is for the whole state. This is the whole state. Yeah, 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 this numbers. is, but yeah. your question was, yeah, yeah. Well, so the, so the British set, set it up. Then the Spanish come in in 1783, and they keep that same division. The first map that Bill showed had that same division there. Okay. The Americans come in, and they put it all together. It is it is one one state now, Florida, but they they've got two counties, Escambia and St. John's. <laughs> and the division between those two counties is not, as you would imagine, the Apalachicola River. They make it the Suwannee River. Right? <laughs> yeah. So already you're seeing a sort of fragmentation of, uh, of, of government and division there. Now one thing we haven't spoken about, we won't get into it here, but um, we haven't said it doesn't include American Indians. You probably know by this time the, the Indian population was decimated by mostly by disease, but war, slavery, etc. There's some estimates that uh, the Indian population of Florida approached th over 300,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so by this time in 1821, you still have tribes of Indians, you know, Creeks and Seminoles, but they're they're much more dispersed. Okay. That's another. Another story. <laughs> so Cusick figures that the slave population in 1821 was about 50% of the population. By 1831, it's grown to 15 and a half or 16,000, which is roughly the same proportion as, as the white uh, population. But you've got to say, where did they come from? They probably came from the north with some of the white plantation owners. Yes as they came south. But of course, this is the net population. It doesn't take into account the very large number of people, most of them black, who fled this area in 1821 because they did not like the repressive laws that were coming into place, that were coming down uh, from the north. So this is a quote from uh, Jane Landers that uh, Bill mentioned earlier, which sets the scene from it. And forgive me if I, if I read here. Once Florida became a territory of the United States, the Indian, African, and white worlds that had once coexisted and shared space were deliberately separated. The social and legal system introduced by Southern planters wed to concepts of white supremacy, chattel slavery, and Indian removal might be imagined as one dominant circle of whites with two associated but unshared circles of much diminished size in its shadow. So that's the concept that we need to uh, carry forward. Uh, Daniel Schaefer uh, quotes, quotes this, Americans replaced a mild and flexible system of race relations, which the Spanish had, 
with a severe definition of slavery which viewed African Americans as degraded members of a despised race and which erected institutional and social barriers between whites and all persons of African descent. Yeah, so he's, he's talking mostly about Florida here. You know, we're if, if we if we move into other parts like Mexico, uh, you know, you know, South America, and those kind of things, that we would we would probably be speaking of different of different conditions. Right. We would be speaking of different conditions. Yes, so what were some of those attitudes that uh, the the incomers from the north uh, brought here? First, the two caste system the belief that the population should be either white or black slave. A belief that black slavery is essential to the economy. Zephaniah Kingsley wrote uh, a very powerful treatise on the importance of slavery to the Florida economy. And yet he was married to a black, black wife. Uh, there was fear of losing control of the black population. Half of the population is black and half is white, and the white half is very worried about insurrection. Uh, Can I add something to that? In the larger context, when we talked a little bit about the revolutions that were going on, we didn't mention uh, the Haitian Revolution. You know, in, in the in early 19, late, late 18th and early 19th century. And quite frankly, that uh, many plantation owners in the United States were worried about that. Okay. And they saw Florida as that, that kind of condition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And these guys were certainly opposed to an armed black militia, an armed Indian militia as well. You know what? I forgot to show a slide, and I can't. That's all right. I was going to show that there's an image of the, the Negro Fort Massacre from 1816, and I didn't even mention it. It's a lovely picture, Bill, but I don't know how to get it up there. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that it was, it was a British fort, and there were about 3,000 Indian and black soldiers that were trained that were, that were there in the fort, and they had agriculture around that. So that was one of probably one of the more prominent um, uh, sort of minority of communities there. So there were several all over the old home of Florida. Mm -hmm. So what happens under this new territorial government uh, that we have established in 1821 uh, and imposed uh, from Washington and set up in, in Tallahassee? Well, they, they started a progressive purging of this free black caste. Uh, in 1827, a rule was passed that free blacks were not allowed to enter Florida. So that's the closing of the borders to, uh, to them. Uh, they were forbidden to assemble. Uh, carrying of firearms was restricted in 1828 and then removed entirely in 1833. They were disenfranchised barred from jury service, barred from having their cases heard by a jury of their peers, and they were banned from testifying against whites. Interracial marriages were barred, and the children of such marriages were unable to inherit their parents' estates. Uh, there was a discriminatory head tax imposed, uh, a poll tax, if you will, and whites were charged a dollar per head per year from the age of 21, and blacks were charged eight dollars per head per year from the age of 15. Uh, manumission, that's the gaining of freedom, uh, was, uh, was penalized. Uh, a slave owner freeing one of his uh, slaves was charged $200 for each person that he emancipated and had to post a security bond for that person. Uh, freed men, they could gain their freedom in Florida, but they had to leave the state within 30 days of emancipation. And any non-compliance with the above allowed the sheriff to seize the person and sell them back into slavery. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. <coughs> there was, thank you. Uh, there was a structured government beginning to form too. Uh, it was military and out of St. Augustine. It was a monarchy and it was flexible. It moved to the American imposed system, territorial government based in Tallahassee. Uh, first was in St. John's County, which was one of the two counties that the, uh, that the US established for Florida, Escambia being one, St. John's the other, and then Nassau County was split out of, uh, of St. John's. And Fernandina, uh, still an old town in, in those days, was set up as the county seat. And so we have a, a structured government rather than a very loose, almost anarchic government under the Spanish. And so what happens? Well, the, the residents here petition the US Congress to charter Fernandina as a city. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, this is the uh, petition uh, that they sent to Congress and uh, they ask that uh, his Catholic Majesty, the King of Spain, reserve to himself the right of 1,500 barras, well, that's about 1,400 yards, round all of the 14, 45 towns in, Fl Fl in Florida, commencing from the Flagstaff, which was probably up on the bluff or the plaza at, at Old Town, uh, and forming a circle for the convenience of defending the place when not required by the king. And so the, the, uh, the petitioners ask that Congress def uh, confirm the right of the town of Fernandina uh, to be farmed and to be held by, by the locals. And the area of that petition, if we, if we look at it now and we put the center on the Flagstaff at the plaza, 1,400 yard circle. Well, it, it doesn't cut, cover much of present day Fernandina. It goes down to the bottom of the, uh, uh, the, the West Rock um, Mill. Uh, it goes out uh, to Eakins Creek and it goes above into, uh, into uh, Fort Clinch State Park. Uh, the circle here, or the definition of, uh, of uh, Fernandina, as we'll later see in what was charted, is in fact defined by the west coast, uh, by, by the western uh, side of the, uh, of the river uh, going out there. These were the people who were the petitioners there. And let's just take a look at some of those names and let's look at those which are familiar to us and we see them carrying forward into later history and also look at the mix of names there that we can, con can conclude perhaps what, uh, what race they were. Uh, Charles Seaton later went on to become the first mayor of, uh, of Fernandina. Uh, Acosta is a fairly familiar name, certainly in, uh, in Jacksonville. Uh, we've got Dioses and Mabrites. We've got Triades, well they're spelt Trié here, uh, they are also spelt, spelt Trié, T-R-A-E-Y-E, and uh, <coughs> still have a number of, uh, uh, of descendants here, you may know Beverly Trié, uh, who frequently comes to uh, Old Town meetings at the, uh, at the museum here. And Neil, Neil and Frank. Frank. Neil Frank is her brother. Do you know Neil? Oh, Intra and yeah. also the uh, the Harrisons. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't been able to establish that connection yet. Yeah. I'm working on it. But. Okay. Uh, so these were probably uh, fairly white folk. They were certainly male by their names, but they were the beginning. Uh, they were the the early movers and shakers here of setting up Fernandina. So what happens in 1821, or rather in 1825, excuse me, an act is created in Tallahassee to create this city of Fernandina. You'll see that it, it defines the beginning point as the, uh, uh, is on the east coast of the Amelia River 
uh, close to the center of the old redoubt or water battery, which was presumably the fort there, and a circle of 1,400 yards is, is what is again carried forward. Note particularly here, and I'm reading the first line here, uh, be it enacted that all of the free white inhabitants of that part of a meteor island. So the view was there that a citizen was white, period. Mm -hmm. uh, which is is a contradiction to the Adams Nice Treaty. Yes. That, and I forget the article, but you can see that down downstairs. Adam Sonis uh, required that uh, citizenship be conferred on all citizens, regardless of race. All inhabitants. All inhabitants, thank you. Oh, one other thing, you go back to that for just for a second. I don't know. <laughs> I thought you were an electrical we? engineer. <laughs> so, but, yeah. Uh, you can't see it as a top, but it says the governor, who was Governor Duval at that time, okay, you know that name, mm -hmm. um, and the legislative council, the head of that was uh, was Mr. Hernandez that we've seen before, mm -hmm. Joseph Marion Hernandez. And so he's already in a position of political importance. Yeah. And this is in 1825, right? Yes. When it became a city. Mm -hmm. So continuing with the charge with the rights and duties that uh, the city is now uh, conferred to, uh, are these various controls, uh, control of retailers of goods and liquors, taverns, and keepers of wagons, carts, and drays, and so on, right down to the bottom where the responsibility is to restrain and publish uh, and punish vagabonds and disorderly persons and the disorderly conduct of Negroes and persons of color. And if, I like, it, if it didn't need to be nailed in, mm -hmm. it was nailed in then. Yeah, and also prohibit tippling houses oh, yes. and lotteries, <laughs> well, which we have, we have yeah. plenty of here. Yes. <laughs> and right at the bottom was the charge here that Charles Seaton, Domingo Acosta, and Francisco Ponce be appointed inspectors to superintend the election for mayor and alderman of the said city on the first Monday in April next, which happened to be April the 1st, 1825. So getting back to uh, race relations again from, from government, we see the steady stripping away of free black rights, which were, as Bill says, conferred by the Adams on this treaty. Zephaniah Kingsley moves his family to Haiti. He's concerned about what is happening with this oppression. George Clark recognizes and names his black offspring in his 1834 will, which makes good reading, but there are extensive court battles which he loses uh, to prove, or, or, or his, his children uh, conduct, and they're unsuccessful in maintaining the claims uh, in the will that uh, George Clark clearly laid out. <coughs> Anna Kingsley, interestingly, returns from Haiti to main, maintain control of her estates, but has, again, further inheritance battles. Uh, Nancy Wiggins, that Bill mentioned earlier, uh, was one of many black and mixed race families that fled for Cuba. Uh, the Kingsleys, uh, you'll remember that uh, Dan Schaefer uh, spoke here at one of Jennifer's uh, plays, Tough Times and Hard Women, was that it? Strong Women. Strong Women, there you go. And uh, Schaefer, <coughs> went to Senegal in uh, March of 2018 with Jan Jane Landers and they found there that Anna Kingsley is extremely highly regarded. There is an Anna Kingsley Street, it's a street name for her. And these were uh, some of the people that they met and uh, the, the descendants of the Kingsley family there. So 1821 was a pivotal year for Florida. We can say 
happy 200th birthday, Florida. And so please check out the exhibit and learn more. Thank you. Do that. I don't know if we have any questions. We have a few minutes for questions before we move. I think we have some uh, some food, some light hors d'oeuvres, things. And the exhibit is open. I'd like to, uh, the Summer, uh, should thank Summer and, and Jennifer yeah. and Thea for putting this together. That's fine. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I have a quick announcement, though. Um, well, thank you, Bill and Mike. That was great. Um, so we're going to be getting new floors in this room on Monday. We're very excited. But as you're leaving, if you could all take your chairs and just put them folded up on the side of the room, that would be very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> so this is historic, too. This, this is the last public meeting in all the traffic. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, we're taking 